Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Worship at St. Luke. We're so thankful that you've chosen to spend part of your day with us today, especially if you're a guest. We're thrilled about that. And let's remember, we are all together, even though we're in different places. It's Memorial Day weekend, and we want to begin by honoring those who have given the ultimate sacrifice in the defense of our freedoms. And we honor them today. That's what Memorial Day is about. It used to be called Decoration Day because what people do on Memorial Day or Decoration Day is go out and decorate graves of soldiers, but also oftentimes of other people. Maybe you've done that. Go plant flowers and put a flag on someone's grave. There's a grave in this old cemetery from a Civil War soldier. It has the flag and the little Civil War emblem there. But today is also the last Sunday in the season of Easter. This has been a most unusual Easter season. And it's also the last Sunday for our series titled, What's Possible Now? Where we've been learning from the experience of the earliest followers of Jesus, the apostles, those who saw Jesus raised from the dead, of what's possible now as we look forward to our own resurrection, as we try look forward to moving out of this pandemic. So I'm going to put all that together today in the sermon as we rest in this truth that because of the resurrection of Jesus, we thrive in hope today, trusting that tomorrow's worst has been swallowed up in victory. I give you over now to the capable leadership of our worship team, and we are so happy that you are with us today. Oh, we look to the sun. Set our eyes on a Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Oh, we look to the sun.
everlasting one, Jesus our God, beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God, oh we look to the sun.
Let's pray. God, we praise the one that set us free. And not just in the life to come, but in this life. Free from guilt and from shame in our sin. And God, we can't repay that, but we praise you for it. God, I thank you for the blessing of being able to sing together and praise together, even when we're not able to physically meet. God, we love you and we praise your name. Amen. I invite you to get out your Bibles and follow along with today's lesson in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, 12 through 26, and 51 through 58. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Moving on to verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy will be to be destroyed is death. Moving on to verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he give, gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of our Lord. May our hearts and minds be open to God's word for us today. I'm here, as the sign says, at Ayer Cemetery. 
a small old cemetery on Darling Road on the east side of Gehenna that my wife and I often pass by on our bicycle rides. You can see the gravestones behind me, many of which are broken down. It's an old cemetery. We can have mixed feelings about cemeteries. I remember as a kid growing up, we'd try to hold our breath when we went by a cemetery for some reason. I suppose that's because cemeteries remind us of death, something we don't like to think about. Now, people say that there are things worse than death, and that may be likely true. So here's a focus question for us. For you, what is a worse that tomorrow could bring that causes you anxiety today? Before we leave this Easter season, before we leave this series titled, What's Possible Now? Let's remind ourselves that the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. That because of the resurrection of Jesus, we thrive in hope today, trusting that tomorrow's worst has been swallowed up in victory. Now we're going to continue to learn from the early spouse of Jesus of what is possible now. We refer to the earliest followers of Jesus that saw Jesus raised from the dead as the apostles. The resurrection of Jesus and his appearance to the apostles changed everything for them, including their outlooks and their future. As a way of understanding this, here's a brief accounting of the reports of the resurrection of Jesus from the writings of the apostles, what we call the New Testament. After an early Easter morning warm-up act where two angels appeared to a few women at the empty tomb of Jesus, the New Testament goes on to report that over the course of the next 40 days, the resurrected Jesus appeared at least nine times raised from the dead. For example, we read today in 1 Corinthians 15 of one account where Jesus appeared to over 500 people at the same time. And then 40 days later, he ascended to heaven. But that did not stop his appearances, raised from the dead. The book of Acts and the letters of Paul report that at some time later, maybe a few months or up to a couple years later, the resurrected Jesus appeared to Paul on the way to Damascus when Paul was going to arrest and persecute some earlier followers of Jesus. This led, of course, to Paul being converted and becoming a follower of Jesus. And then the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, the Apostle John reports that many, many years later, when John was a really old man, the resurrected Jesus appeared to John on the prison island of Patmos that prompted John to write the book of Revelation. The truth is, we do not know how many times the resurrected Jesus appeared to the apostles. Now, that may be a little disturbing to you that we don't have all the accounts, but Listen to this passage from Acts chapter 1. After his suffering, that's after Jesus died, Jesus presented himself to them, that's the apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over the period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So far, what we've come to know is an account of the resurrection of Jesus. But look at what the next verse reports. On one occasion, while Jesus was sitting, was eating with them, he gave them this command. When they heard the command, they met together, they asked him, they asked him questions. You see, on one occasion, like it happened often. And you get that impression because this seems to almost be the new normal for them. I won't say it's casual, but they're so used to it that they're eating with him, they're He's teaching them, they're having conversations, they're asking questions. I think that this means that Jesus appeared to the apostles many more times than the nine that are clearly reported. And another part of the accounts of the resurrection that really draws me is the emotions that the apostles had when they first saw Jesus and then later. For example, you see in this painting behind me uh, by French artist Eugene Brand, one of my favorite paintings that hangs here in our living room, is of Peter and John on the way to the tomb of Jesus that early Sunday morning. And if you could get up close, you could see the emotions in their faces. Well, the New Testament writers report some of those emotions. 
that they felt amazed, perplexed, startled, fear, sad, great joy, trembling, astonishment, slow of heart. I think that means they were disbelieving. Hearts that burned inside of themselves for a couple of them, like they were bursting with overwhelming excitement. But some were troubled and questioning in their hearts, disbelieving for joy, like it's too good to be true. Initially, their emotions for the most part were fear and disbelief. For example, we know that the first person that Jesus appeared to raised from the dead was Mary. And then Mary went to tell the disciples. And in Mark 16, verse 10, it says this. Mary went out and told those who had been with Jesus, that's his disciples, while they were mourning and weeping. I find encouragement in the fact that while they were mourning and weeping, not when they'd gotten their act together, they got their emotions in check, but in the midst of their troubled emotions, the, res the report of Jesus raised from the dead comes for them. I think we can take some encouragement in that. The report of, that Jesus has risen from the dead comes to us while we are weeping, while we are mourning, while we are scared, while we are disbelieving. In the midst of our fears over tomorrow's worst, comes the report that Jesus has risen from the dead. That's why I'm encouraging us to believe today that because Jesus rose from the dead, we thrive in hope today, trusting that tomorrow's worst has been swallowed up in victory. The resurrection of Jesus was never far from the minds of the apostles. The rest of their lives, all of their missionary work, their whole faith story centered in their experiences with Jesus, especially when he rose from the dead. We see this in Paul's account that we read today from 1 Corinthians 15. He begins by giving a brief account of the resurrection appearance of Jesus, and he concludes that part by saying, and last of all, Jesus appeared to me as one abnormally born. What's the emotions you imagine there? We know from the book of Acts that Paul initially, when Jesus appeared to him raised from the dead on that Damascus road, that Paul was bewildered, maybe fearful. He was actually blinded. But now he almost seems thankful that this is a motion of gratitude. And last of all, Jesus appears to me. The emotions of the apostles did changed the more Jesus appeared to them and as they lived with this new reality of what's possible now because Jesus had raised from the dead. Paul goes on in 15 to describe that the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. That because Jesus raised from the dead, we have the sure and certain hope that we will rise from the dead as well. That evil has been destroyed, that death has been defeated, that in a twinkling twinkling of an eye, it says that we will be changed, that to have glorious and eternal bodies. And near the end of the chapter, Paul puts it all together in one brief sentence when he says, death has been swallowed up in victory. That Greek verb there means that death has been swallowed up in victory in the past and the present and the future. That death has been, and everything like death, even things that are worse than death, have been swallowed up into victory in the past, right now, and on forever. The resurrection of Jesus infused the apostles with justifiable hope for their future. It freed them from the dread of death and things that are worse than death. And it empowered them to spend the rest of their lives sacrificially serving others for the sake of the mission of Jesus so that more would come to trust Jesus and be saved. Paul concludes chapter 15 with these challenging words. Let nothing move you. That is, nothing move you from this hope. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, the apostles thrived in the hope each day, trusting that tomorrow's worst has been swapped up in victory. And the same is true for us today. 
let me ask you this question. What are your fears about the worst that tomorrow could bring? In these past weeks, what have you learned about yourself and about your fears about tomorrow's worst? Fear was real for the apostles. We see that in the resurrection accounts. Jesus acknowledged it. He saw their fears and he addressed it. Our fears are real. I see my fears. And some of you have allowed me to see your fears. Most importantly, Jesus sees our fears. He knows that they're real. And you are courageous when you acknowledge those fears. But can we all acknowledge this? That sometimes our fears compel us to imagine that tomorrow's worst will happen. And that can become debilitating for us at times. For you, what is the worst that tomorrow could bring? It would be courageous for us to acknowledge that. Not to try to push it away or ignore it like it's not real. I need to buck up, you know, have that st stiff upper lip. It's courageous to acknowledge those fears that we have for tomorrow's worst. But here's the hopeful news. In the midst of understanding that these fears are real to us, we can begin to cope with them effectively. Maybe that would be helped by seeing a counselor. That's what I did, and I found it very helpful. But I think also the truth that we are holding on to today in this sermon can also help us to cope with that. Maybe we can start to ingest this truth that because of the resurrection of Jesus, we thrive in hope today, trusting that tomorrow's worst has been Swallow up in victory, that it's already taken care of. Is it possible for the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life that we have to empower you, to empower me, to live lives of fierce courage in the face of the fears of tomorrow's worst? Here's a couple steps I've imagined that might help us get down that road a little bit. First is a head level step. Another is a gut level step. The head level step is this. This chapter that we read from today, 1 Corinthians 15, is a wonderful chapter that I think can help to instill fierce courage in our minds about the resurrection. I would encourage you to read it several times this week to let it renew your mind and in this way begin to establish fierce courage in your mind, even in the midst of fearing tomorrow's worst. And then on a gut level, there's another verse that Paul wrote that's always troubled me. It's Philippians chapter 1 verse 23 where he says, I desire to depart and be with Christ. Paul is saying, I desire to die and go be with Jesus. I've always struggled with this verse. Like, really, Paul? How can you say that? Now, Paul is, doesn't have a death wish. This is not some suicidal ideation. He just is so filled with the remembrance, the knowledge that Jesus rose from the dead, that it compels him to say this. Paul was never far from remembering that Jesus rose from the dead and that because of that, everything changed and that death has been swallowed up in victory. So we, can we take a cue from Paul here and do this on a gut level to actually say these words? I desire to depart and be with Christ. Even as I say them, like, oh, well, not really. I'd like to live a lot a while longer, which is true. And this is not some kind of, you know, death wish or suicidal ideation. It's simply kind of getting that knowledge down into our gut. So say that. I desire to depart and to be with Christ. Say it a few times. I think that'll create a kind of fierce gut level courage based on this truth. 
that because of the resurrection of Jesus, we thrive in hope today, trusting that tomorrow's worst has been swallowed up in victory. Let nothing move you away from this hope today, dear ones, the hope that we have in Jesus. God be with you. My friends, in response to God's gracious goodness, let us join our voices together wherever we are and confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join our voices with the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Each petition will end with, Lord, in your mercy, and your response to make these prayers your own is, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, call your people to be one as you are one. Unite your church in the truth of your gospel, the love of our neighbor, and the call to proclaim your reign to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Breathe new life into your creation. Guide scientists and researchers as they work to find a vaccine for COVID-19 and cures for other diseases that beset us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Come to the aid of your children. We pray for those engulfed in grief, those without supportive families, and for all who are isolated, powerless, or afraid, that all may rest their anxieties in your care. We pray especially for family and friends with COVID-19, for Bill Buss, Annie Buss, Jim Butterfield, for Nancy Doherty, Marilyn Edwards, Walt Franklin, Jeff Lee, and Elizabeth and John Hoagland, Sheila Howard, Jonas Croning, Jeff Rose, DJ, KB, and Corey Sharp, and Angie Smith, Fiona Wagner, Jim Wells, Ron Whitman, for the family and friends of Clarence Siegfried, and the family and friends of Violet Tardif. We give you thanks, gracious God, for the birth of Knox Joseph. And we thank you that Carl Waddell is now negative for COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord. Amen. So a few announcements for you today. First, as we said before, we are very happy that we can gather together for worship. We're pleased that you are here with us. So if you've not done so already, would you take a moment and fill out the online connection card? We greatly appreciate it. Also, every summer in Gehenna, there are families who, because school is out, cannot provide lunch for their children. The need continues, certainly, this summer. So we're participating again in the summer lunch program as a church, where for one week we provide a daily lunch for children in our area. So we're in need of your assistance, and we'll be sending out information this week for ways you can help with the summer lunch program. Make sure you take a look and see if you can help. And my friends, as we're developing plans as a congregation to return to public worship in the future, you should have received in Friday's email newsletter a video from Pastor Steve and a document that is that outlines the phases of reopening our building 
that was developed by our staff and the church council. I encourage you to take a look because both the video and the document go in greater detail about the plans moving forward. And if you've not seen it, you can click on the Stay Informed button on our website and it will take you to Friday's email newsletter. And also a survey was sent out to you this week where you can share with us your thoughts and feelings about our return to public worship. Please fill it out if you haven't done so already. Your feedback is very helpful for us as we move forward. Thank you. Those are the announcements, my friends, for this week. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The blessing of our living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, surround and sustain you, keep you from harm, and fill you with courage. Amen.
Well, we hope this worship has been a blessing in your life. It's been a pleasure for us to share this time with you. And until we talk again, may you be blessed because you are a blessing to others. Take care.